Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight on another YouTube Live. I am extremely excited to for to share the guests that I have tonight because um, as some of you know, as many of you may know, skydiving has been a huge passion for me for the last eight years. And it has also been something that I've pursued because it intersects a lot with the work that I do, which is a lot about overcoming the nervous system so we can transcend our limitations and become full of the joy of the potential of who we really are. Um, and literally tonight, I have just two, I can't even believe you're doing it, but sometimes you just ask and, the, and people say yes, and it, it's so worth it. Two incredible women. The theme of the night is uh, become your leader. Now, every, at the beginning of the year, I did a, a tarot reading for the collective and I got monthly themes. And this card, the King of Wands, is the card for February, which really is about leadership, power, entrepreneurialism. I'm sorry, it's a king. It should be a queen for these ladies. <laughs> but it's really about incredible um, having the energy and the the focus and the willpower to bring incredible things into the world. So tonight, my guests are Amy Shimlecki. She is the um, first woman to be invited on the Red Bull Air Force. Just amazing. And Chazzy Ratz, who is of Arizona Anthem, and she's one of my uh, my mentor is one of my favorite people to actually learn skydiving with and she's tolerated me for a while now so <laughs> both of these women were powerful figures in an event called Project 19 that I had the fortune to be here in Arizona to watch I actually just do this thing where I kind of follow my heart and I ended up here for the week and it was just literally one of the most powerful moving incredible events that I've I've ever been around and the energy because I'm just a like feed off energy was just incredible so I want to turn it over to you Amy was the co-organizer of the event um which was a women's vertical head down skydiving record and Chazzy was a regional organizer correct yeah we got titled regional captains from the beginning um, yes. like you said Amy was at the top of the, the echelon getting this together and called me in the beginning. And I was like, what? And before she was even halfway through the spiel, I was just like, I got to be a part of this. Yes, yes, I want in. Yes, yes. It's incredible. Amy, how did you come to how did it come together? I, I just just briefly and I want to just pop up this. Well, no, no. You tell me a little bit first how how it came together. How you because you did this in a very special way that really made it successful on a lot of different levels. Correct. Um, I, I'd like to say yes, uh, but it was um, really inspired by the women of the suffrage movement, and it was inspired by basically the the passing of the Nineteenth Amendment, the centennial of the passing of the 19th amendment was in 2020. And if anyone doesn't know, the 19th amendment was where women got the right to vote in the United States. And it was not an easy thing to happen. It was not an easy an amendment to get passed. It took 72 years of men and women fighting for it, just mm. like protesting and working hard and putting their lives at risk. Um, and it, the, the, that passing of the 19th amendment and the celebration of the centennial inspired us to do this project where we, the goal was to get a hundred women together to break the vertical world record. And, and the previous you know, record had been like 65, correct? Previously, it was 65, right? Chazzy, or was it 64? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> it was, it was 65, off. and prior to that was 63. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So just yeah. pretty like little increments making it bigger. Yeah, and then we, we were like, let's make it 40% bigger, <laughs> Woo! which was um, a big challenge. For obvious reasons, we usually make it like 15% bigger. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, we had to postpone because of COVID. Right. And in the end, we didn't get a hundred way, but 
what we walked away with and and we'll we'll deep dive into it it was yeah. so much more powerful and meaningful yeah. than than a number the event was great and really all of my gratitude of course to the team involved but the women that came before us i mean if yes. it wasn't for them none of us would have been there um at all i want to pop up uh an image of the the formation because you just touched upon something there um which has been really kind of like moving me i suppose um and this is the this is the formation of what ended up being the 90 seven way Oop. Hold on. Uh, I'm showing you all the wrong things um so this is the image of the 97 way and I just I wanted to share this idea with you because what you're ta talking about you know in the spiritual world where I come from we're always talking about portals and gateways and vortexes and sacred geometry and these these shapes that have power that kind of that lead us into transcending our consciousness and lead us into going into a different place that we haven't been before and so when I look at this picture I feel that energy of all of you women gathering together and creating that gateway to inspire people to go further and based on, as you said, the people that we don't see in that picture, which is everybody that's come before. And that's why I just think this was just an incredible, um, uh, it's, a, it's a doorway into, into the, our next dimension of existing as, as women and human beings on the world. So that's my feeling on this image. How about you? <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, if I would love to be able to hear what the women of the suffrage movement would think about, you know, the possibilities a hundred years later, and I would love to dive into the future and see a hundred years from now, what, what is happening. Um, but, you know, it's a constant for women as much as people like to argue it's, it's work. It's, it's a sure. constant work, you know, to, it's not over yet. There's a lot of um, equality yet to come. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we, our whole team stood for um, mm -hmm. equality within women's rights and, and at large. Yes. And I felt a lot um, because coming into skydiving, there's a similar, um, I had a stand-up comedy background where there was a similar number of women to men in, in those two scenes. And I'm actually happy to say that the skydiving scene has been so much healthier <laughs> in regards to the culture than the, sta the stand-up world, which is incredibly toxic and, and just a nightmare. But that's why I do feel and connect with that passion of finding ways to inspire women to go for stuff um, and to keep forging and pushing that boundary till we really do have the freedom to be as powerful and creative and as effective as you ladies are in what you're doing. Thanks. <laughs> wow. Yes. 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 Yeah, it is um, absolutely incredible what happened to bring us all together. Um, the timeline wasn't as originally set out. And I think it almost just made it even more powerful when we finally got to be together. Mm. Um, all the thought was there and the the excitement that you usually bring to the record and the nervousness, I feel like for the veterans really, really settled down. And the purpose was bigger than just like trying to do this athletic thing to get a record. There was just so much more meaning behind it for everyone. Like the, and the calm was there, you know, yeah. even the girls who were new and nervous were feeding off of our calm and everybody was incredibly focused and, and it really truly was for more than just a skydiving record. Totally. And I, cool. I, I felt that off because I had quite a few people that I knew here that I've been watching 
train for this and work towards this. I heard about this from, um, I think, J Jasmine Kayla when I was living in Hawaii. That's when I first heard the whispers of Project 19. And then when I kind of moved more to the mainland, I've seen these girls training in the tunnel and, you know, slowly got to know um, more and more of them and seen them work towards this goal with that spirit. And it, everybody that I spoke to was like, it's the purpose that's pushing us forward. It's the bigger meaning that's making us just want to do this. And it was just so beautifully calm. And um, yeah, like it's just such a harmonic thing. There was no drama. <laughs> it was just like no tantrums, just beautiful. I I personally really enjoy and love the women's records endeavors. My original motivation for organizing the first one in 2003 was I was part of a the first vertical world record men and women in Sebastian, Florida. And there were about 60 people there. There were three women. And, you know, I feel like it's hard for me. This was my perspective. So what I'm about to say, just understand that this was my, what, what I was feeling. Mm. It, it really felt to me that there were, there were more eyes on the women. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone saw the women were looking at the women more because there were only three of us, you know, there. Mm. So you were more harshly judged it felt like to me but not only were there more eyes on you it felt like there was a bias in the sense that if one of us were to make a mistake it wasn't something logical like oh they they just need to do this um and they'll be fine oftentimes it was because we were women like mm, right. you know, chick you know it's chick yeah and it felt it felt really wrong to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, and when I get real honest with myself, I know that I also inside of me have a bias mm -hmm. against women. Like it's how I was raised mm -hmm. and I have to confront it and like really admit it and, and change mm -hmm. it when, when I feel it coming on. Mm -hmm. So after that experience, I decided along with Melissa Nelson, who was at that event with me, um, we decided to organize women's records because we just thought, you know, if it's going to feel like this for us, let's just mm. do our own thing. Let's mm. just organize our own event. So that year we started working on the first women's vertical world record. And, you know, that the, they have been growing since then. That was mm. in 2003. I love that you brought this up because, um, and sorry if I keep bringing it back to stand up because we went through so much of the same stuff. And when I came into skydiving, some people are like, and even women are like, well, we shouldn't do women's things. It should just all be, you know, equal or just like we're, you know, and coming from the world of stand up where it was so hard and also for um, um, just people of color as well. I've always been saying you need to have these events so women have that chance to have that space to be kind of not inundated with that energy of that 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 kind of criticism or those extra eyes and and just have that opportunity to really express their work whatever that may be and have the chance to be at the top of the game of that with all that without all that extra kind of uh, peanut gallery. <laughs> Very what true. do you feel about that, Jazzy? I guess from a, a personal standpoint, my very first journey into world records was a women's world record. It was in the 2007 to 2008. Mm. And I wasn't on it. I didn't make it. Mm. <laughs> Amy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, but because the group was so inclusive and encouraging, I didn't hang up my stuff. I mm. came back and we kept training and we kept doing things and then going for the next one. And I have always, always said this, I think, to women who are starting out on that world record or that training or whatever it is, 
Um, the first one might not be everything you want it to be, but keep going. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I did get onto a women's vertical world record. And after that, I got onto the general world record and kept going. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a defining moment of pushing me down. It was a defining moment of like, well, that's okay. Keep going. Mm. And it just opened up doors after that, like after the first women's vertical world, world record, then all of a sudden, like, oh, wow, I have this confidence now. I'm going to go mm. for the general one too. Mm. I'm going to keep training. And yeah. it's just continued to push um, shameless plug to my teammates. I've had absolutely awesome teammates too, going through this um, hashtag best teammate ever. Um, in Irish that I get to do freestyle with and VFS and still work with and go to records with. Um, so it's been super encouraging to just like continue pushing through this sport. Yeah. Because it's just having that platform where you can get to that point of like a deep comfort and a belief in what you're doing. Sometimes that doesn't, you know, you need those. I mean, that being cheesy, like the safe spaces to grow, you need that to build that, um, and which is something I wanted to talk about, which is this sort of idea of biology of belief, like skydiving. <laughs> Jessie knows because she's got on jumps with me and <laughs> had the joy of coaching me this weekend. You know, you can't, with skydiving, it really has to be deep in your body that you believe you can do it. That's what I'm always kind of seeking, that point where it's not just me going, yeah, I'm going to believe I can, you know, like whatever, 10x my business or get my soulmate. Your body has to be in that belief zone with you. And that comes from doing it. You know, it doesn't, what, what do you think? <laughs> I think a lot of it also has to do with visualizing too, which right. can pull into the belief system, right? Mm -hmm. So if you visualize something going perfectly, you're upping your chances of it going perfectly, you know? So you're believing, and like you said, with your body, with your mind, like everything has to be set and focused. Yeah. And yeah, they have to be in tune with each other and you have to believe in yourself. And sometimes you might have to tell yourself, go this way. It's going to be okay. Yes. Well, I just find sometimes, and I feel like I've jumped a few steps here because um, first of all, I feel like both of you were natural athletes. Am I right? I, Amy, I was looking into your life. And it, it made me laugh so much because you played grass hockey, correct? Yeah, field hockey. Field hockey. And I was watching this video of, about your story and it was sort of telling that, you you know, you struggled in school a little bit, but then you found athletics and you kind of really connected with that. And I laughed so hard because when, when I told my dad that I was taking up skydiving, his, his face was just so afraid because he said, I used to take you to play field hockey every weekend. And I know how, like, not very coordinated you are and stuff. So I was like, this is hilarious. But, uh, but I've always had tenacity, so that's my strength. But, Amy, you... You were like naturally athletic, Chazzy. I feel like you're probably naturally athletic as well. You have gymnastic background or. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I was ever any good at any of those things, but yes, I, I grew up being very active. Uh, both of my parents were, you know, running softball leagues and racquetball and doing the things. So I was always around it. I think there was always a joke that my mom was playing volleyball when she was six months pregnant which right. at that time was like, oh my goodness, you know, but it totally makes sense. Like my parents have always pushed me to like, Hey, sun's up. Why don't you get up and do something? You know, right, so right. I was always in sports and involved in running around for sure. So do you feel like in terms of belief, um, that there's been, when you start to move into more like leadership stuff, gaining that biology of belief is something a little bit different. Did, did, does leadership come as easily to you or the responsibilities of coaching and mentoring, did that come as easily to you as the physical side? Where, where have you had to work the edge? Whoa, that's, that's a really, I feel like that's a really loaded question because there's, there's got to be a moment where you realize that, that you can do something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've been, 
I don't want to say yelling for a long time, but I, when I started organizing it, that came pretty naturally to me. Mm -hmm. And we joke that it's herding cats Mm -hmm. because you do have to constantly keep track of people. Mm -hmm. But now that you asked that, and I'm like quickly thinking back, like I was a project manager for 17 years. So I was very used to multitasking and making sure everything was in a row And even before that, like all I could do was like wait till senior year when I could be captain of the gymnastics team because I was going to be captain. And and I was, um, but it was always something like I looked forward to being able to make those locker decorations and do the like locker room speech, you know, like (laughs) the people I looked up to. So I can see that. um, Yeah, I feel like it, yeah, it feels weird to say, yeah, it came naturally to be a leader. Yeah. Um, I, can see, I mean, I can see that in you. What about you, Amy? Was there any point where you had to go through a, a sort of, um, uh, oh, can I really do this part of it? The sport part comes easy, but the leadership part is has got different challenges to it. Yeah, I I think that I've always struggled with the imposter syndrome. Mm. Um, and, and I, and I still do, it takes a lot for me not to feel like I'm actually worthy of having a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. Like I really, really have to feel like I'm an expert at something. Like I feel that way about the vertical world records. Like I, I know it very, very well now. Yeah. So I feel pretty good in that realm. Um, but I've always been pretty insecure and had to kind of struggle with that. And, Mm -hmm. and it would depend on also my, my mood at the time, right. Which would, I used to deny this a lot, but you know, how much I slept or if I drank a lot or if I was eating well, you know, so all of those things. Um, But like confidence in myself, it is something I had to work on and I still work on. Um, but I feel like I, I've had a, a knack for being a leader, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, it w- was also like made me nervous all along the way. And I still, I still have mixed, mixed feelings about it's it. You know, I, I like being a leader in certain ways, but other ways I haven't really enjoyed it so much. Um, right. So that's also, yeah, like when you talk about having like the the world record stuff is very familiar to you. That's kind of like the belief is in the biology at that point, if it's not kind of disrupting you so much. I uh, One of my tunnel coaches gave, gave me this idea that has helped me a lot. <laughs> um, and he got it from another coach, which is this idea of unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then unconscious competence, where it's sort of this progression of at what point do we actually physically become this thing that we're desiring in a way that we don't have to think about it anymore but we're just doing it properly. Um, thoughts on that journey? I'm definitely somewhere between conscious incompetence and conscious competence in <laughs> skydiving, I would say. I would have to write it down to even like figure out the <laughs> the, the steps. Um, I've always thought of, that. I think it's the same thing as in freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Right. When you're a freshman, you think you know. When you're a sophomore, you're like, oh, shoot, I don't know. And then as a junior, you know, but you don't know you know. And then right. a senior knows they know. <laughs> um, and I, I think in some things, like I'm a senior, and I look back at beginning skydiving me, and I'm like, oh, man, I was such a freshman. Like, I right. thought I knew everything. Um, and the cool thing now is, like, even when I'm – sophomore junior status I'm aware the things that I don't know right and and it's like it's I don't know more maturity and and comfort of like okay there's more to this story or wow I'm having these feelings okay it's cool I'm having feelings and then try to figure them out you know so yeah never ever like always sure um but at least aware now that 
there's more going on and I don't, I don't know everything. Well, and that's sort of being able to have that um, curiosity about the adventure or the, the, the learning path. I try because it's, yeah, because it's, I'm, I think stand up, I was way more of a natural ad and skydiving just like it, it's really been a lot of hard work and persistence and looking at all those little internal voices and kind of taking, you know, taking them on one at a time and where do they come from and working through them. Um, but it's f- being able to feel things and then go, okay, but what can I actually do not just stay in the emotion of it but what what can I be curious about in how to like work through this instead of it holding me back does that resonate at all Amy what's your approach when you're having the feelings so I think a quality of being a good leader really has to do with understanding your skill set and and really listening you also have to be a a good follower in order to be a good leader Mm. I I certainly 20 years ago wasn't at the level I'm at today in skydiving but I was still organizing events and promoting certain concepts and I I I had a skill set and I would perform within that skill set so I think it's important to be realistic about what you can and can't do. Um, If you're just confident because that's what you need to be in order to, to be good at something that it doesn't really work that way. You have to, (laughs) if you're, if you don't have the skill set, you have to be real about it, especially when your life is on the line, like in skydiving. So it, you know, I think that it really is important to keep your ego aside in that sense. And ultimately, the success of any person or leader, it really has to do with the team. It it really was all about the team project, Project 19, the the Mm. sponsors and the whole team and just like the whole every every single person that was involved in it yeah that they um the connective um the whole organism is really what makes something happen in terms of I have a saying which is like dream belief manifest and dream is like that vision belief is the work that brings something into the final result which is manifestation but it's even in that image it's everything that you don't see that's behind the hundred women or the 97 women in that image that's actually bringing that all into a manifestation um and the when you're open you allow that greater force to work with you rather I feel like when I started stand up I was all like I'm gonna do this on my own and you know make it on my own and it's just a stupid way to work really honestly (laughs) because you get humbled that way uh and skydiving is humbling I I would love to show just because we kind of dove right right into your inner world, but I really want to share just a couple of videos of both of your work so people can really see um, how um, just sort of <laughs> amazing you both are, really. Um, this Amy was the, the first woman on the Red Bull Air Force. I picked this video because this is you... Uh, wingsuit, wingsuiting over New York, where I, I mean, amazing. Yeah, that was um, definitely my most memorable skydive, hands down, without question. Really? That being there, that's me, I'm floating up, get back down to John. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm on the right side. I'm second. I'm in the middle on the right side. Right. And, um, I grew up outside of New York City, and the the whole team that was on that jump, the guy to the right of me is Jeff Provenzano. He and I grew up together. That's the Freedom Tower down there. This was on the opening day of the Freedom Tower, mm. and if you look down at the bottom there to the left, that's the barge we landed on. Yes. barge in the middle of the Hudson River 
it was a really special jump. Um, my mom was on the ground, you know, and when you think about that jump, like you mentioned before, what does it take to get to that? Yes. Place? So of course the experience in skydiving that we all have, but Jeff Provenzano literally moved to New York, got an apartment in New York City with the intention of trying to pull off projects like this. It's mm. all about who, like the connections, right? So mm. it he worked, he lived in New York for years, mm. meeting people, getting to the places where he could, you can't just do that. You can't like call up the mayor and say, Hey, right. I want it, pulling something like that off. Okay. The, what it takes to do the skydive and fly your wingsuit in that way and land on a barge. Okay. That's all for us. Like it's what we do. Right. But <sighs> like getting the permission to do that, it was net, it was next level. And I do think spiritually we're all here because of luck but when it comes down to it like jeff worked really really hard right get that pulled off and he had to keep it a secret the whole time too i didn't even know about it until like it was really ready and then we all had to keep it a secret there's a lot that kind of goes into things like that it's not yeah. just jeff being Oh, he gets everything and he's hustling. Right. Sure. Well, and that's the going from the dream to the belief. I think and then making it manifest. You've got to work. work. I uh I think I was living in New York. And this is what I want to share with you is I'm actually a ranch hand and I did my license at the ranch. Hey, Shawanga. Which, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is another cool thing that I discovered about you is that you also uh, got your license at the ranch. And um, I was wondering if you ever jumped with Linda. Yes, yes. yes. I did. Linda and Carol did my level one with me or my level right. two. They did my level two with me. And that was, that was really, really special. Very special. So Linda is really um, my, my, my OG um, skydiving angel because she got me through. So my third jump, I was told I was uh, probably one of the people in the world who couldn't skydive and like my brain couldn't do it. And I got a really, really heavy talk. And then Linda pick, picked it up for me. But in terms of a leader and an, an original person that is, um, really inspired me was Linda because I had been working with um, cancer patients for quite a long time and when I started skydiving there was Linda she was currently in remission from cancer bald uh, just a total badass <laughs> you know bossing every round on that drop zone um, and just all through her cancer treatment she kept skydiving and she was just like She's my kind of, a, yeah, like original female Shiro of, of skydiving. So I just, uh, yeah, like, I don't know. But you met Linda. She was also a, a cat. She was one of the original cats. She was just like this great, powerful character. Um, and I think she really, what I, some some people weren't keen on Linda and I was like, but she's so OG. Like whatever she went through, as a female skydiver for decades before you arrived and I arrived on the scene, certainly, um, we don't even know what her journey was. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. You know, I know that it's quite unpopular to bring up things like the misogyny that exists within skydiving. And I, I, I get it. Nobody wants poop in their cornflakes. And I, you know, nobody wants to hear about politics on their, on their weekend away from work, but um, the, there is a lot of misogyny in skydiving mm. and it's gotten a lot better over mm. the years. Um, mm. 
but it's still there. And it was really, I mean, I remember when I started in the nineties, um, the only, what, the skydiving videos were all men and, and women that were in those videos were basically objects to look mm. at. They were often washing airplanes in bikinis and you couldn't right. see their heads like Jay-Z, straight yeah. up. Like that's what it was. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and, and don't get me wrong. I love joking around and I like having fun with so just, sex jokes and like there's a time and a place like probably more than most people like I have yeah. an HD, um and I'm sure I'm sure that Linda did as well yeah. uh, no no doubt uh but yeah there's there's definitely a line mm. um and I know as a woman um and I'm, I'm sure Linda had to do this I used to I didn't realize I was doing this, but there's just constantly a strategy Mm. in order to navigate through situations Mm. where it's generally men in charge. There's, there's an approach that you have to kind of finagle. You have to really work it. Mm. I, I remember young in my career where I realized if I was the boisterous aggressive woman mm. with hairy legs and hairy armpits that I was I was that's who I was when I was younger I I wasn't afraid to tell people that I hated the way women were represented in the sport mm. that I really didn't like the imbalance and I'm not going to show my pilot the pilot my boobs to get extra altitude right and I was like a very very aggressive and I would get shunned, you know? Mm. So I realized I, I had to change the strategy mm. that I took and just relax a little bit, um, you know, so the balance there without basically doing things that were against my morals and values, like really be true to that, but also change that strategy. And, yeah. you know, when we talk about like lifting up women, mm in the sport and, and creating space for women in this way, it's really like, it's not about excluding men, not, not at all, mm-hmm. not even a little bit. It's, it's more about really uplifting women in a sport that traditionally they're underrepresented. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, <clears throat> I hear you, the standard, I used to have to follow uh, Andrew Dice Clay all the time at the comedy store. I'm sure as a New Yorker, you know who he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you can only imagine what that kind of uh, vibe was at those clubs where these were the, kind of like the heroes. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, pretty intense. But um, so I, but I will say, I, I do feel that there are a lot of great guys in skydiving and I, it has actually helped me a lot after the stand-up world but to keep going in skydiving I had to really work through honestly a lot of PTSD from the stand-up world <laughs> just so I could be around that same number of guys um, and I hope that there is that you know, the progression and the healing is going to keep happening um, and, the, you know, in the community and things like this, because I was a little bit bummed out when I got here because I'm all like, yeah, this is unreal. Project 19, women skydivers, it's so great. And I heard some of those mutterings of people being like, oh, they can't, there's not enough women skydivers to pull this off and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, why are people even bothering thinking about that? Like, what's, what is the purpose of that? And I'm curious for both of you, being such prominent women, how much do you actually still, even subconsciously or subliminally, feel that in the ethers? I'm very energy sensitive to stuff like that. Um, is it how do you kind of strengthen yourself to not let the peanut gallery get to you and to uh, to ma- maintain your your knowingness and your agency as you move forward. <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so I um I really like 
I just kind of take life one day at a time. And if that's too much, I, I take it one moment at a time. Um, not to say I don't plan, obviously, you know, something like Project 19 takes years and years of planning, but I really have a flexible type of, um, I'm ready to take on a new form if I, if I need to if all of a sudden the container that I need to fit into is different, you know, I, I could kind of shift. Um, I, I get very motivated when people say that something is impossible. Like, that's so funny to me. Like, I'm like, Oh yeah, it's impossible. <laughs> Watch this. Um, I think the word impossible is for really kind of small minded people. And I, that, that just is silly to me. You know, I do want to mention that, you know, I talked about if I, if I need to adapt and change, I'm just a human and I'm going to make mistakes. They happen all the time. I, I make mistakes constantly and I don't really know if the choices that I've made are ultimately going to get me to the goal that I want. And my goal isn't to do women's records only. Mm -hmm. My goal is to get women in more places where they're underrepresented mm -hmm. and to create a balance, like an, an equality there. Um, and I, I think that within skydiving, my next record that I'm organizing is a mixed, a head up world record, mixed men and women. And my goal for that record is to have the energy and the experience of Project 19 alive and well at the next head up world record. So I am very comfortable leading women in this way. Mm -hmm. and sometimes I haven't been able to lead men in the same way I've, I've, it's been difficult. Um, it's been harder for me for sure. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it's because women are just better followers than men. Um, I think there are definitely some men that don't want to have a woman in a leadership role. Um, but I think a lot of them really don't mind. It's just this, like this, what is already accepted and the energy that already exists in the community. Um, I don't know if they're going to be ready for the concepts mm. and kind of energy and team building that project 19 had. Um, mm. And, I don't, and I don't know if I'm completely prepared to get people to that space but I'm strategizing on how um, it's something that's been in the back of my head. Like how, how are we going to do this? Like, how are we going to get people to lead us at the head up world record, the way project 19 worked? Um, Cause project and 19 had a lot of mentorship mentality, didn't it? It was about getting people and training them to become uh, as opposed to, well, everybody's showing up already cooked and now we're going to make it happen. Would you, yeah. would you agree? What was so, yes, there was a lot of mentorship. And for myself and the other, like Sarah Curtis, my co-organizer of it, we we got a lot of mentorship from Dan VC, um, was such a big help for us. And I think really continuing to consult him on future projects, especially the next upright world record is going to be key. The, um, the free fly scene really needs this, this new way of moving forward. What we did that I think if there was one way to describe it is it really was a team. It, people felt like Yes, you have to come prepared as an individual. You have to, you, each person needs to really be responsible for themselves and the preparation that they put into Project 19 before they get there. But it, it's a team. It's not individuals. Like it's a team thing. It's pretty obvious from the outside, but when you're in it, 
it could really easily feel like it's competition between the other people, which it couldn't be further from that. Um, yeah. yeah. It definitely didn't feel cutthroat. Obviously, changes had were made during the thing. And and Chazzy, I know you I was out here last year when you were doing some of the smaller training pods out here and getting people kind of up to speed and and stuff like that how do you how do you feel with um and you work you're currently working in a team as well what do you feel like you've learned about bringing a team together and being in a team and which you know which way is teaching you um being in a team does that teach you how to be uh teach people to be better teammates. I guess I'm looking at team, 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 teammate stuff now. Um, yes, but I, I kind of want to bounce back a little bit to, to project 19 mm. because to me as a participant, like take me out of the regional captain role and just have me go through the motions of our tunnel camp. And then the week of project 19, this record was different from any other record we had done because that team training existed early on Mm. and it made a huge difference when we showed up for the week. Then I'll do a little sidebar at almost every other record that I've ever been to. When we get down, there was a lot of like down from the skydive. Everybody's landed. Everybody's cool. There's all these little groups looking at videos and pointing fingers and oh, so-and-so, so-and-so, oh, all these things. And you start, you start, I shouldn't say everybody feels like this, but for a long time, I fought like hating and just feeling like, oh, well, clearly it wasn't my fault. They were burbling over there and a wave came through and it just felt like a lot of like, well, it wasn't our plane. Like our plane did perfect. Their plane didn't. <laughs> right, right? right. And we, we kind of got away from that in the women's records and then project 19 comes up and all of a sudden we're practicing a 40 way base. Mm. That is how now we are to think about the 40 of us. Mm. which uh, 20, was it 2010 was a 41 way record. Mm. So here we are years later and that same amount of people now considers themselves a base. Right. Right. When we landed from the 72 way attempt, which was the first official record that we were trying for during project 19, when we landed I remember looking like straight at whatever camera was like there on landing. I was like, we now have a 72 way base Mm -hmm. because the mentality just changed from like somebody pushing or pulling on me to like, we were all becoming base and all becoming team. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that the way that we approached project 19 with our really great leadership and encouragement was to all work as a team. The, The difference really, like I, this was supposed to be a sidebar from landing from a a general record where everybody was like, it was your fault to Mm. (laughs) landing from project 19 and all of the girls in the the area that you're around. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was me. Let's watch. It might've been me. There really was just like a lot more of like everybody taking responsibility for themselves and wanting to work towards the team effort Mm. than everybody being out there for themselves. And I think now that we have over a hundred women that were in that space and learned those things, and a bunch of us are regional captains or on teams or in leadership roles, we can continue to influence the newer jumpers coming up too, so that we can perform better and calm and more responsible and as a team to, mm. <laughs> to give Amy what she needs for the next upright record. Yeah. Um, and I really think that's going to be a thing. That's how we worked our, um, our lead up to as a regional captain, I was doing camps mm. and I remember like throwing the camps and guys asking me if they could join with, like, yes, of course yeah. we're, we're all coming up together. The difference is the women are going off to do a record and you have to cheer them on. But right now we're all learning together. Yeah. And it really just created a really good community for that 
um, level of skydivers here too. Like there are new friendships. There was a whole bunch of encouragement between yeah. like every side of everything. Um, even a lot of the like uh, belly fly side of the hangar was encouraging to the free fly side. And there was just a lot more cohesion. I know. Right? Oh my God. We crossed it sides of the hangar. Beautiful. Like in the event, every, I mean, I watched the thing from the, the 97 way formed from the ground. And I actually just wanted to bring up this point because I feel like when we're going for, and I'd be curious about how you balance this when we're going for a goal and there's some sort of single mindedness, like it's a record and like, then, oh, well, you don't technically get the record, but the thing is you lose that magic of acknowledging this thing happened for the very first time, even though it's almost an arbitrary thing, what makes something a record, like how many seconds everybody's holding for, well, that makes it a record. But the beauty is, the magic is that this thing happened that 96, 97 women were holding hands in the sky at the same time. And it's so easy when you're going for a goal and you need that focus and dedication to then lose the, the wonder. And the and that was a look you had on your face, Chazzy, when I saw you after the jumps and a couple of days later. Uh, when I get to jump with you after you've just done all this world record breaking stuff is that you had wonder in your face, just like when we see a beautiful piece of, of nature. Um, yeah, I'm curious how you like, what's that edge for you in terms of how do you balance the the drive to the goal with staying in the magic of what's actually happening? <laughs> I just constantly live in the magic. It's fine. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's uh, probably just focus, right? When when we're training with our teams, there's there's a focus. When we were working on these world records, there's a focus. Mm-hmm. For me now, it's I'm reading a book on the plane, and then at a certain altitude, that book goes away, and I just like continue to visualize. As I otherwise, I'd drive myself crazy. Um, but I, I set it out. I'm very, um, make lists in my sleep type of person. So I know exactly where I want to be at what time and at those altitudes, like, okay, now you need to visualize one time. Okay. Now go back to your book, um, and just stay there. I, I think like there's just, um, a lot of focus and tapping on that, that team building thing, or like being with my teammates, there are times when we know we need to be serious. And even though we make a joke on jump run or we have a silly handshake right before we get out, we're all like saying the dive flow in our minds, right? Like we all want to be there for each other and work towards a common goal. And actually, I would just want to show a little bit of this is your um, uh teamwork <laughs> speaking of teamwork um to just show you show a little bit about this um the work that you do with the team um sorry I'm just having a little bit of a difficult time uh it's okay. while it's I'm looking at this, Amy, what what are your feelings on that balance between the focus and the wonder and the magic so the when you mentioned about the the goal how do you stay engaged through the process for me the goal is comes second to the process i need the goals for the purpose behind the day to day so right. i personally and I, and i think we're all different you know so you kind of have to be true to yourself but i need the goal for all of the rad shit that happens before the goal. Right. And that's what I love. So I, you know, I, I, I've never really wanted to go to the drop zone. When I was young, when I was really, really new, like I would want to go to the drop zone and just jump, 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 jump as much as I can. But for now, I need purpose. Like I need a goal Mm. before I do anything. And, but that, the goal gives me like, it's the, the, the juice is, is what's happening. The, the process, the journey, that's yes. really what I love. 
of. So I, uh, this, so this is Chazzy's, um, oh man, it's disappeared again. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I feel like that I have to make little, little goals, little personal goals to, um, to, um, because then when you get them, <laughs> you know, you get the thrill of getting them basically. So, oh gosh, here we go. I'm still like a little bit lost on this one. Sorry. Um, where did my Google go? Are you guys seeing the? Oh, sorry. My I see goal. Amy's um, New York. Like, yeah, that one's on the preview there. I don't know why it's not letting me go to the the um, the Google. What? Can you see the Chazzy's job? Oh, there we go. There we it go. Looks like, it looks like a team. Is this VFS? Oh, this is, yeah. This yeah. is a, yeah, VFS. And this, I just, oh, well, because most people don't really see <laughs> this sport of skydiving. <laughs> That's me looking really scared in the purple. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the times we just see the, um, there's a certain level of the skydiving we see, but I personally, not really until I came to the mainland and started going into the tunnel, really had even seen VFS like this. We see kind of like the, you know, people doing backflips out of the plane, but this is incredible athleticism and focus. It's one of the harder things to do in skydiving is uh, be on a VFS team. And I'm not it's saying hard. that just because there's only like always three or four teams in it and Belly's like, you know, a hundred teams. Um, it really truly is hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's um, um, like you're training pretty constantly to do, be be at this level, this is some more of the uh, the VFS stuff. So this is where I'm, you know, when you're really working so closely with your team like this, um, as strong personalities, what have you learned about kind of sharing energy with other people? Even for Project Nineteen, a lot of powerful women gathering together. Um, a lot of pretty A-type people, I would imagine. Um, what do you think are the biggest lessons you've had to learn about just kind of having a powerful leadership energy, but then sharing space with other powerful leaders? On our team alone on Arizona Anthem, um, it's been a long time coming for Irish and I. We've been on teams together. Uh, this is a, this clip that you're showing is a freestyle, yes. which I affectionately call flips and shit. Uh-huh. Um, so, so Irish and I've been on teams for over 10 years together and they yeah. haven't always been awesome. Right. Um, it just, the team dynamic makes a big difference. The energies, the who's organized, who's not, who's always late, um, who has a problem because it's cold, because it's hot, because they didn't eat enough. I'm so incredibly happy for the last few years of Anthem because the five of us have gotten along so great and we share roles. Um, before I joined the team, um, they would have to choose a team captain for the weekend because they needed somebody to make the decisions for the weekend and they would trade off. Right. And eventually... Um, Irish and I joined the team. Things were going really well. We were training and we were like, do you guys think we need to appoint a captain every training camp? And we're like, actually, no, we don't because we all fit into our roles and respect each other enough and can have adult conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, really refreshing and uplifting to be on a team where we do get along this well. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's, you know, if, if my hands are full, somebody else will run up to manifest and take care of things. Um, Seth or Irish are generally the ones that come up with the dive flow. Um, I'm usually the one who does the Facebook post for a, a event, you know, or like get, <laughs> you made the last one happen, Georgia. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and then, <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Um, and even that just, I, hopefully you saw that as our team works together really well, yeah, um, get done with the weekend. And I'm just like, Oh my, we pulled that off. Like you guys were perfect. Like, it's like, we all read each other's minds. Um, mm. and it's just really super awesome to be, um, all have this much experience and be able to get along with each other this well. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's just, um, uh, a really good calm that we share and a focus. And yet we can joke around or like if somebody messes up, we just like play it in slow motion a bunch of times and like make fun of ourselves, you know? Um, so (laughs) yeah, like that. Right. But it should be that fun environment where, yeah, okay. We'll learn from it, but I'm not going to get down on somebody for messing up. Like we all do that to ourselves enough. Um, I know I do it to myself on the team all the time. Like Seth has been trying to get me transition the correct way for three years. So when I do it right once, I'm like, Oh my God, dear diary today, I finally (laughs) did it. You know, (laughs) that's Um, how I am. (laughs) But, (laughs) and it's great. All the little wins. (laughs) This ongoing patience and awesomeness that we share is it's, it's like nothing I've ever been a part of. And I think this is why all I like to do is work and train because they're like my favorite things, being busy, being with my team. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, I stole the floor. I, I really like my team. No, it's great. And But that's, I think, also but when people are mature and they're leading themselves within the team, not trying to take, they're just doing their part. It's, uh, it's maturity. How about you, uh, Amy? What's the big things you've learned about, um, you know, power in the room basically because I do feel like for a lot of people coming into positions of leadership and power for women it is a little bit newer a lot of the times and we're trying to feel out that edge I just keep thinking I'm going to show some footage of the uh, the actual record jump but how powerful you all were um all the the women on the base and everything what how, yeah what's your kind of vibe on um sharing the space with other powerful people. I I think that when you want to be part of a team, the the first thing that people need to think about is what are everybody's goals? What what do people want? And two things. One, what are the goals? Two, what level of commitment does everybody want to put towards those goals Mm -hmm. and if people can't get on the same page with those two things then you probably shouldn't be on a team together but those things I need to be discussed and and talked about Mm -hmm. and a goal or it can involve flexibility you know there could be you know, some, I don't really know what Mm -hmm. I want in a year, but this is what I want now. Like there, there, there could be goals that are flexible. Maybe that's part of the goal. Maybe part of the goal is like, I just want to try it and see where it goes, you know, and everybody is on that same page, but those things are really important because when you're, when you're on a team with people, you're spending a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of your energy. And depending on what your goal is, you know, you may or may like it. it so say your goal is to compete and um, have a good time and, and everybody that's their goal. But if someone's goal is to win the world championships in six years time, you might want to find different teammates if you have those different goals. Um, And if somebody wants to put um, like a, a, a lot of energy, all their kind of energy into making the goal happen, they want to do a thousand training jumps a year. 
versus someone that wants to do 200, those things obviously need to be talked about, yeah. right? And kind of spelled out. Because both are kind of okay. <laughs> You've just got to like. Yeah, like, what do you want? What does everybody want? Yeah. Um, I, so those things really have to be discussed in a mature way and kind of laid out and written. I, I, I would like prefer to write them down mm. and um, just make sure people are on the same page with that. Um, and, and maybe it's just like, I don't know, I just want to kind of try it. I don't know much about it. Let's try it. And then have that conversation again a little bit later. But I, as long as people can be, have the same goal and the commitment level, like kind of spelled out in general, what everyone's going to give into the, the team to reach those goals. And then, and then after that, what Chassie touched upon this, but they, they have a system, right? Like, so they all kind of know it. And at first they had rotating captains, which is a great strategy because everybody is understanding what it's like to be in the lead and then mm. to be a follower. So you kind of are all like strengthening those different aspects, which is so important to be a good leader and to be a good follower. Um, but then after a while, like Chazzy said, they didn't really... They didn't need to have official captains because they've they've understood their roles more and they and they get it. Mm -hmm. um, but the main idea behind that, from from what I think, is that is that process you need to understand. So, like you get down from a training jump and you know where you should be and what you should be doing. So it's not like someone is gone to get a coffee and <laughs> they get back, someone has gone to the bathroom. And then when they get back, someone's on the phone with their mom. Right. So there's like this understanding and process. And you know, that, that really takes work and communication. Um, but I think that personalities are important and can make the experience absolutely wonderful. Um, and then it can also make the experience absolutely horrible, right? If the personalities, but I think if, depending on what your goals are, like if you're like, I want to be a world champion, um, you can personalities come last. Like, right, it, it because it's last. just the focus on the training and it doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 and but if your goal is to really have a good time in like more and maybe having a good time is the being a world champion and and so that okay, duh, that that's having yeah. a good time. But but if it's just more about like a, a different type of day to day experience, then yes, those those the personalities are are really, really important. Because um, it's more the social aspect at that point rather than the um, the goal thing. And I think, but like for me, when I look at the record stuff, I mean, it's amazing. I would love to think I could get to that level, but I'm also honest about what I have to give to the sport and to the, because there's a responsibility to the other people that you're doing something like that with. Team, records, big ways, you have to step up to it if you you know, don't have that, like it, you, you should know yourself basically and be able to communicate. It's all fine. But <laughs> like most things, we get in trouble when we're not honest about these things. I want to get to some of the footage of the, um, the actual record. Um, because this stuff, and what I did want to talk about this, um, because I've been watching this stuff even here at the Bent Prop, and it's amazing to me how many people, skydivers, have not watched this stuff. I'm sitting there going just like, ah, gaga, and people are like, what are you watching? And I'm like, it's a Project 19 stuff. And they're like, really? Like, these are active skydivers here. And there's something about um, there is no sort of, there's no audience in the sky. So, so much of this goes on unseen, even by people who are actively in the community. There's no, uh, there's no bleachers in the sky. Um, but I just want people to see how incredible this work is. Hmm. Um, what is your feelings about 
getting the sport seen more at this level to get people inspired or to really understand it because this is divine <laughs> I like the the point you just made there's no bleachers in the sky <laughs> no there's not um also skydiving is not your Phoenix Open or your Super Bowl so none of us none of us almost none of us grew up watching this on TV mm-hmm. or yeah. going to the local drop zone to check out a meet. Like that wasn't a thing, right? Um, when I grew up, it was softball, basketball, um, and track or whatever, like things you could go see or watch or do. And uh, aviation is just so completely different than that. And skydiving, you you don't have it as a child, right? There isn't a um a trading card for skydivers that came with some shitty piece of gum that everybody (laughs) was trying to collect, you know. So it wasn't Jazzy (laughs) Rods. Yeah, Yeah. it it just it wasn't available, right? Like you grow up in and watch football or soccer, whatever it is, or you play t-ball as as a little kid. And that's not what skydiving is. So I think it's really mind blowing when you finally get your first skydiving video and and now things are on the internet and now our tolerance for watching things is less than 30 seconds. So it's crazy now to try and get a a sport out there for people to know and understand, even though skydiving has been around for quite some time. When you get your A license, you have no idea how many jumps that tandem instructor had, how many jumps your AFF instructor has that they're on a team that they've like done some secret night military ops somewhere. Like you don't know any of those things. You don't know how many medals they had. And you don't know those things until you like, I don't know, creepy Google them. (laughs) Like me. (laughs) (laughs) me (laughs) Or you end up in a a bonfire conversation where then you learn about those things or like you see the Red Bull footage, you know? Yeah. And you're like, time out. I I think I saw that. And I think now um, kudos to the highlight team, um, Amy, good job. The The whole team is doing demos and really bringing things into like social media and doing these demos where little kids are seeing these parachutes land. Right. So now there's like an influx of visibility that's going to help like bring this sport out a little bit more. Um, I mean, it's kind of nice where it's at, but it would be super awesome to give some notoriety to people who are breaking barriers and doing really cool things. Well, and that's exactly why I wanted to spend some time on Project 19, because I really think it is absolutely incredible what you achieved, what you did. And because also, as I say, there is no other sport that actually takes you know, 97, 100 of the athletes to be at this peak level at the same time, on the same day, on the same jump. There's no other sport that asks that. And yeah, I just want people to see this. Tell us about these feelings as you're coming out of the plane. So this is the the formation. Um, Amy's in the the middle uh, base. What are you going through? <laughs> Happiness. <laughs> Happiness? Yeah, I know. Um, a- for me, there was a, a lot of fun, actually, because my teammate Carly and I were exactly across from each other. Um, Amy was in the base that was launching, right? They were holding together. And then Carly and I were across from each other. We were kind of racing each other. Um, so it was really super awesome to get there. And then we're supposed to be like really calm and take a second. And we're like one of the jumps, she was even like flashing her fingers at me, like ca- counting like one, two. Okay, now we can touch it, you know? Right. Um, and then once we were in it and we locked out, then it was just like hardcore base flying. We're becoming this 40 way, we're becoming the 72 way. Yeah. Um, and then it was just like extreme focus, but I, I watch this stuff now and I'm like, oh my God, like I was there. 
That so was incredible. so cool. I, this is, uh, well, I wanted to save this video from the actual jump to last because I love this one, which is the view for Melanie Firth's view, because it's just like an incredible view of both of you. Um, and so, just so people who don't understand that you're, you're what the altitude here that you're jumping out of, it's 19,000 feet. You're on oxygen. Yeah, it was 19,000 feet above ground level. So really it was um, 20,500 feet. Mm. Yeah, we're, we're high up there. And this is, you had done how many jumps in the week before this jump? This was jump. So is this the, this is the 97 way? Yeah, the I think one. that I think that we did um maybe 23 jumps or or something like that um yeah but the jumps were gosh it, it really was for we had been working for four years right like it, it was a long long journey it was a lot like and this was just so here's the I just love this view because you get to see both of your faces just being total <laughs> total rock stars in the in the middle so this is the base of six six going out mm -hmm. that's amy with the red bull helmet and then i love this here comes chazzy just so solid it's unreal yeah i'm like Ooh, there i am chazzy taught me the mad face this weekend <laughs> yeah yeah amy's doing it too and you look yes cool. i know you're both like so right? strong <laughs> I, I wonder where i learned that from she's smiling there a little bit <laughs> i think i've often heard people say that you need to smile if you smile um, you're going to do better. You need to smile to be able to do good skydiving. Um, and I completely disagree um, where I, I think that there are like energies that will be communicated through certain facial expressions. Um, but if, if smiling is not like what you're actually doing with your lips does not really matter. <laughs> well, I definitely think if I'm smiling for head down, particularly, it seems to be, you've got to keep your head still. Like you can't be all like, Woo this is great. <laughs> yeah, you definitely can't have unnecessary movement. But to me, the, what is most important is that, you have a, a sense of calm and, and that you're able to perform at this optimal performance level. And the way you express your emotion or even the emotion you have is completely irrelevant. Mm. It, if, if you are angry because of something that happened on exit um or if you're like overjoyed because of something that happened it doesn't matter you whatever you are experiencing you can harness calm focused energy you know that yes. that's the goal so whatever that emotion is you let it fuel if if I'm angry, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get better. Like I'm just, okay. gonna, if I'm stoked, I'm just, I'm just gonna get better. Yeah. And that's really, to me, to me, what the goal is. So I, I have like a full focus, um, in those jumps and I, I might not have time for a smile. And I know that some people might, need that in a coaching environment. So mm -hmm. if I am coaching someone, I would make an effort 
to, to give them a, a facial expression that, that I think they need to receive in order to feel good and perform well. But in this case, it, it's something that I was communicating to the group the entire time, like mm. that, that it really, who, like, I don't need to see you smile. I don't need to see you angry. I don't care what your face is doing. Like mm. breathe, stay calm. Mm. And, and if, if you're calm, then no matter what happens when problems arise, which they always do, you're going to be able to process and manage that problem efficiently. Yeah. So, it, yeah. Well, that certainly seems the difference between uh, when you're coaching someone, you're bringing them into a calm space through a through a smile or whatever, so they're not feeling tense. <laughs> I know I'm very sensitive to facial expressions, um, but when you're actually doing it, it is that neutrality that you're seeking. I could talk about this for, with you for hours, but I don't want to take up too much more of your time because I love all that that side of the the uh, getting to the place of the no mind and and the the calmness and how you actually bring yourself into that stillness. But that would be another whole whole session. I want to say I'm so incredibly Hi. grateful for you coming on and sharing. And is there, I know that there's, um, I want to give a quick shout out to somebody on that jump who actually saved my life, which is Nell Flemish. She discovered four of my uh ribs ripped in my canopy when she did a a check on it um Mm -hmm. some of the other girls like Tamara and um Michelle who have seen at the tunnel Jasmine Erica this was kind of personal to me not not that I'm really close friends with all of these people but to watch people go through this journey and I think that that's what that that image of a hundred people, that's a hundred journeys to get to that point. And when we go on a journey like that, like you say, Amy, it's everything that happens within you that is the sort of incredible part of it and is like the evolutionary part of it, in my humble opinion. So I just want to celebrate all of your journeys to um to bring forward this this beautiful, this beautiful skydive and this beautiful um feat that you did is there anything you'd like to share um anyone you want to give a shout out to before we sign off that I I know there was a lot of incredible people on that jump but the reason I really wanted to speak to you actually sorry one last thing I want to say is when I was thinking about leadership Amy I don't know if you remember we had the moment I was bartending the celebration party and um you'd all worked so hard all week I was so happy to just be there and like serve you all drinks and and celebrate with you but towards the end of the party you actually started cleaning up the tables (laughs) and I was like Amy stop stop please I'll do it I actually was like embarrassed I was like you need to just celebrate and be celebrated and enjoy and then you weren't having a bar of it. You just kept <laughs> cleaning up. And I'm like, well, this is why Amy is who she is, because she just does what needs to be done. That was my feeling. And I thought that was a a huge uh, indicator of something even deeper in the leadership uh, factor. Thank you. Thank you for, for saying that. I um I feel like there is kind of two sides to that. I I get, um, I, I get social anxiety, mm-hmm. especially, and I, I, I don't drink anymore. I used to, but I don't drink anymore. So when I'm in party situations, if I get a nervous energy, I have to do something. <laughs> so it was like helping me, like I, I didn't want to go home, right. but I needed something to do. <laughs> Besides be like, hey, you want to talk about something? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I can relate to that. And, and I also like, I was a bartender for um, 10 years. I worked at the Ben Prop for 10 years. So I, you know, it was just like what, you know, I always, it, it's hard for me not to clean when I am in that situation. But you know. I love when everyone is working together where really feel I don't like feeling like that's not my job like or that's not that 
Yeah. And it could be a downfall because I think sometimes I have been told and when I've been in big projects that I need to delegate more. And I know that that's the, that's what, like, I need to spend more time being the, the communicator in the face and like the person, whereas I'm just like doing the work. You're doing you know, it. Like, I put myself there sometimes because I'm like, and I can't talk to people right now. Right. <laughs> like, I get that. Oh, I, get I really that. need to do. Just- <laughs> yeah. I, I, yes. Cause oh my God, <laughs> so, so much energy to be doing everything. And Chazzy, you, I wanted you, of course, for the, because I just couldn't believe we got to jump with you three days after yeah. <laughs> done this world record. And she's taken me out of my like <laughs> zip fly. But with the same beautiful joy and patience and you're always such a, I really don't feel like until I came to uh, Skydive Arizona and I had a few jumps under my belt, but I really received any kind of like, oh, you're, you're good at this. You do great on that. And um, it's just really helped me grow a lot. And you're always, always kind, generous, um, positive and um, but truthful, you know, like you're a great coach. You're just, I really appreciate <laughs> your oh, Thank your you. Strength. Yeah. Thank you so much. It means a lot. So yeah. Any other thoughts you want to share? Is it, I know you've got, um, time has gone too fast, but you have a uh, highlight is the team that you have that we, it's an all women's team. So I, I, during project 19, I learned so much. i honestly I'm such a different person Mm. now than I was before the project and I want to share with you guys something that I learned in the middle of the project that is like really profound to me and I and I am so excited to teach it to people or just tell people okay when you guys are you know when you're visualizing in the airplane um do you ever like when you're visualizing like all of a sudden, like, like your visual, it just goes to shit. And you just see like problems. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like mm-hmm. you're like visual. Okay. Maybe you're visualizing VFS Chazzy and you're like, and then all of a sudden you're like, you visualize that you brain lock and your, and your brain goes into this disaster zone for a moment. Right. Like that, yeah. that happens to all of us. Okay. So <laughs> during project 19, we were really emphasizing like having this calm state of mind and not just on the skydive, but through the visualization process, through the dirt diving, through the debriefing, just like really having like moving a lot slower than you would think. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and being, being extra calm. Um, because if, if you can be calm, then your brain is able to process more smoothly when problems do arise and they're always going to arise. Right. So what I was doing when that, and that always happens to me in visualization. So what I used to do is I would just stop and kind of do like, Oh, you know, like do like something like that and start my visualization again. And sometimes I would be in this like broken record loop where I couldn't complete a a visualization and it would really be causing me anxiety Mm. throughout the process and almost like become a problem. But when I would have those moments of like, uh, like, like brain glitches in my visualization where I would see like, now my reserve handle popped out or something, uh, whatever it was, I would use that opportunity to practice being calm, even through my visualization and like open up my awareness to like, okay, I have a choice in this space of how I'm going to react. So like be aware of that and choose to be calm. Like the first thing I would do is take a breath in my vision. And this is, I'm sitting in the plane visualizing, right? So I would use that opportunity to practice being calm for Mm. when something does go wrong because you can't how do you practice that right like you're you're prepared and you're ready to execute something and then things go wrong you have to 
react in a calm way, but like, how do you really practice that? It's hard. It's like, you don't know how you're going to act until you kind of need experience. You need things to go wrong to be able to practice and get good at, at Absolutely. problems. Um, but so now when I have those little weird glitches in my visualization, and it happens on demo jumps when I'm thinking about things or any, any kind of skydive at all. Um, now, instead of like trying, starting my over again, my visualization process, like I use that as an opportunity to practice choosing to have like acknowledging a calm state of mind, taking a deep breath and like continuing on. And I just thought that was like, really, I've never done that. And I, I was actually like, one of the techniques like, I do with my clients is we actually go into worst case scenarios, <clears throat> excuse me, and neutralize them. Um, so they become neutral. They don't oh, pop up <laughs> like my little coughing attack. Yeah. What about <laughs> you, Chazzy? Um, That's really funny because I, I did have that thought of like, when I talked to you guys, that one breath meditation is a thing. Um, I don't know if you've seen anything from Damien Ryder, but he came to Scott of Arizona and he has a book and it all focused on one breath meditation. And I didn't know this before I read the book. And then I read it and I was like, I think I was doing that already. I didn't know mm. there was like science behind it. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely in that. Um, so yeah, when things are going absolutely nuts, it's like this yoga breathing or this is one breath that can calm me back down and, and bring me back to where I need to be. Or, you know, if I'm yelling at somebody for not putting a seatbelt in the hole and it's getting heated, it's like, a okay. Specialty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay guys, for safety, let's do this thing. Um, but yeah, just like maintaining calm for sure. Um, I have a, 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 not a secret. I have this endeavor of getting up to the top of Picacho in less than 40 minutes which now, oh my God, I said it out loud on the internet. So now it's like a thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot of that is like focus and staying calm because you're running up the side of a mountain and uh, I don't want to trip and fall. So I <laughs> so definitely have to like stay focused and, and breathe. I think rock climbers, that's why they have a really good advantage with um, <clears throat> when they start skydiving because they have a lot of that nervous system regulation um, centered for and sure. being able to center I'm actually actually this is my final thought is because I come more from that mind body background I am surprised at how little understanding there is on the nervous system in the sport both from um, everything from a trauma perspective to learning how to calm your nerve, vagus nerve down so you go back into what we would call a the stay in play state where you can actually absorb and learn information. And there's tons of tricks that you can use, tools, but there doesn't seem, that's the one thing I would like to see a little bit more education about um, <clears throat> regulating the nervous system. <laughs> you mean just it. relax. Yeah, relax. relax. <laughs> it isn't good yeah, enough. Jump out of the plane and relax. Great, <laughs> <laughs> right, great. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I have two, like a closing comment for both of you. One, Amy, it's been absolutely incredible to study under you and watch the things you do. Um, and tonight to have you be so real and talk about anxiety and the way that you feel um, is, is really like eye opening to me. And I'm sure everybody else. I mean, look at your hat, like you're, you're, you're Amy Shimalecki. So it's really super cool that you're, you're that real and that you're that true. So mm -hmm. thank you for being the woman you yeah. are. And Georgia, I explained you as a positive ball of light that just happens to be at Scott of Arizona. So that's how I think of you. And I'm absolutely honored that you had me on your 1000th skydive. Oh, um, yeah. Congratulations on being awesome. Ooh, and thank you very much for having us on tonight. Yeah. Like, very honored. Yeah. And I do want to thank you both for sharing your inner world because it is <clears throat> it's a vulnerable thing to share the inner world, but if people are going after stuff and they look at leaders and they just have this idea, like, oh, they're just straight up badasses that never feel anything or go through challenges, it actually makes it more unattainable and really understanding that there is a real internal process that we grow through makes it more accessible to, to people to be like, oh, okay. 
I can do this too. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, I'm very grateful. Um, please, anybody who watches this, go and Google all the Project 19 stuff. It's just a tearjerker. I've cried so many times watching the videos because it's it, to me, it's just so moving and amazing, the spirit that it was in. Um, I don't know what else to say. Is there any other thing? Chazzy, you have your team. Do you fundraise for your team? I, um, is there any uh, teams that we can promote, like, any fundraising, anything like that that you want, I will be happy to put anything in the uh, the comments or anything else. Uh, as much as I would love to take your money, I refuse to sell t-shirts. So nope, <laughs> we'll just keep doing our jobs and, uh, and training and training and training and holding events to make you guys um, come up and play with us too. Yes, beautiful. Thank you so much, Amy. Yes, thank you. That was wonderful. That was a really good. It's been an hour and a half, huh? That went by fast. I know, I know. Yeah. Well, maybe we can do it again another time and touch on some other things. It's yeah, or like even just maybe talk offline. And I love conversations, good conversations. And I love um, you know, hopefully doing things that can make the world a, a little bit better, even if it's just for a few people here and there. But um yeah, constantly improving things and conversation is kind of where it starts. It's where it starts, understanding each other and inspiring. Well, thank you so much, ladies. You're incredible. She read us. That was my coin night <laughs> phrase I coined for you. The she, yes. she read us, but she read us. <laughs> uh, we'll see you soon around somewhere. Thank you so much. Nice. Bye. Nice. Bye. Nice.